What's going on everyone, this is Griever back here, bringing you guys the latest Behind the Bar Reviews for Seven Deadly Sins, Chapter 311. Now, as you guys can tell, it's rather late at night, because I'm just here having my last little bit of Baileys, a little bit of a nightcap before. Um, today was really busy, that's why I didn't get to the review earlier, but I'm here now, so let's get underway with this chapter, because overall, the hype... The hype for this chapter is real. The hype is there, and I am, I'm on board. But does this mean the chapter did not have issues that I did not care for? No, it does not. But I will never, ever take away from the fact that not only did some of my favorite antagonist characters, some of my favorite characters in Taizai are back in action. Chandler and Cusack, they were in this chapter. They're here. Uh, it, it's awesome. And the man... The Prince of Darkness, the GOAT, Naya's favorite character, Zeldris. And not only is he back, but he's in a newer, stronger, stronger, better, faster, bigger form. And what is he? He is the next Demon King. So this, this is, we have a lot, a lot to talk about with that. But before we get underway, first we have to go through the paces. Now... The bullshittery that we all know to be Merlin did happen. We all called in the Boar's Hat podcast, link down in the description down below, and I called it myself in my review. Elizabeth ain't dead. She wasn't crushed. Um, some, some folk thought she was. I never held on to that belief. Merlin was going to pull some stuff. Bomb was going to pull something, somebody, and it was M Merlin. Of course it was Merlin. And Elizabeth is fine. She just cut her head a little bit, blah, blah, blah. And she heals up in one of the uh, side panels. Whatever. So they were saying, okay, well, what happened there? And once again, like the, the curse, it, it's back. And they're like, whoa, whoa, what do you mean the curse is back? And I still got to say that curse is drawn so grotesquely beautiful. It's a wonderful uh, concept of perpetual rebirth as this ugly thing. Like it's not, it's certainly a curse. I really like how it's drawn. Um... Meliodas powers up into his full, what I believe to be, the Ten Commandments form. We'll get to that. Uh, his Ten Commandments form. And he goes, alright, I'm going to eradicate this thing for good this time. I'll leave no damn trace of it. Boom! Blows it up again. And all of a sudden it starts reforming. How can this be? How can this be? And here's where we come to some problems. Let's just quickly talk about the whole Ten Commandments form thing. The reason that I believe that the Ten Commandments were still inside of Meliodas' body, if not destroyed, was for the simple fact that when we first got revealed the Demon King in Chapter uh, 299, well, the full reveal in Chapter 300 with the color panel, is the fact that when he was full formed, we got this uh, white bodysuit with the arms and the, and the gauntlets and the whole bit, and he had the power of the Ten Commandments inside of him, and he was the Demon King. When the Demon King was pushed out of him, Meliodas used a never-before-seen form, the exact same thing, just a little more light version of it. It doesn't have the dark fur, and it doesn't have all the demon symbols down those crazy arm things, but he still has the arms, he still has the same looking like the jacket thing, the, the, the one-piece bodysuit sort of look. I am curious as to why Nakaba decided to use the same looking form when it's clearly not the Ten Commandments anymore, it seems to be his own power. I, I, I feel like artistically this could have been shown better, and then I never would have assumed the Ten Commandments were still with Meliodas. I was proven wrong there. I thought they were. However, I'm okay with, proven, with being proven wrong. I just believe that artistically that was not the best choice. He could have shown it rather than said it sort of idea. Um, nonetheless, okay, let's move on to the next portion. The next portion is the fact that Okay, the curse is returning. That's because the Demon King is still alive. This raises a lot, a lot of questions, okay? Um, Gotha goes on to say that, like, clearly uh, the Ten Commandments are still there. They they must not be gone because we all know that, uh, and King brings it up, like, Male took in foreign and almost broke his whole body apart. Normal animals and vessels just won't do. So somewhere... There's only one possibility, and Elizabeth and Meliodas realize it's the worst possibility. They haven't been able to find Zeldris. It must be Zeldris, someone able to maintain all Ten Commandments, the power of the Demon King, as a vessel inside of their body. So they realize this, and we jump away. But before we get to that, I don't believe... Now, I looked it up, chapter 224 and 225 and stuff, and I looked up some previous chapters and such. If this is stated somewhere, 
please link me the page, the panel, whatever, down below, guys. I would really love that. But for my own memory, and then for my own fact-checking, the gods cursed Meliodas and Elizabeth. It was never stated that the Supreme Deity cursed Meliodas and the Demon King cursed Elizabeth in some cruel, ironic twist. Rather than curse their own children, they had the other, the yin to their yang do the cursing, you know? That could, I think I would have remembered that. I, I really believe that I would have remembered a key piece of information like that. But if it was said, I know for a fact it was not said in the couple of translations I could find for chapter 224 when the curse was fully explained the first time, and I didn't see it in any of the current chapters when they were talking about destroying the curses, that it that they were separately cursed by two separate gods. It was always said, the gods have put a curse upon us, and things like that. It was always used uh, plurally. It was never singularly used. My issue with this is that Meliodas brings up the fact that the reason that his curse isn't back, well, not so much his curse, but the reason Escanor reveals why is it only Elizabeth's curse is back. This implies that Meliodas would know if his own curse was back. By this logic, it is not, or at least it's not stated. And he says it's because the Demon King must basically be alive. Mine was given to me by the Supreme Deity, but Elizabeth was the Demon King. My issue with this is not that they added more detail to the curses. It's the fact that they, the moment it became plot relevant, that's when we got this detail. We didn't get this detail when he destroyed the curses the first time. We didn't get this detail back in chapter 224 when the curses were revealed. There was no foreshadowing. It was, we need to explain why in this chapter Elizabeth's curses back in Meliodas' isn't. Well, since we left it vague before, we're going to give, give you that detail that was never stated in 310 chapters up to this point. That is my only issue with it. Um, does it make sense? Is it a retcon? No. It is not a retcon, and it does make sense. It's a detail we didn't get before, but it was never stated otherwise. I just found this a bit of plot convenience. That's my only gripe about it. Um, okay. But this also leaves a lot of open-ended questions with the whole, his remark about the Supreme Deity, because does this imply, okay, he says the Demon King hasn't kicked the bucket then, is what Bond says, and he said it appears so. But by that logic, it means that the Supreme Deity, if Meliodas' curse is not back, does that mean the Supreme Deity is already dead? It's, it's a one in a million shot, guys, but that is certainly a possibility by the leap in logic I can gain from, the, from that dialogue, is that he's not seemingly worried about his curse coming back because he said mine was placed by the Supreme Deity. But if Elizabeth is back, the Demon King can't be dead. So that means the curses are tied that he can't destroy the curses with his own power. And I'm assuming that the Demon King's curse is not any stronger or more powerful than the one placed on Melios by the Supreme Deity. So given all that information, it heavily implies that the Supreme Deity is actually dead. The other possibility which isn't said well in the translation, is the fact that when they move on and Merlin says, this, if there's truth to that, this concerns me, the Ten Commandments, blah, blah, blah. This implies, and I hope, I, I don't think the Supreme Deity is dead. I'm saying that this is left very open-ended in a bad way for that possibility. Um, the thing that I believe more so is what they meant to kind of imply is that the Demon King has found a new vessel and that the Demon King... Another thing I was wrong about, I'm taking a lot of L's with this chapter, guys, uh, that was said in the Discord uh, today and earlier, um, that I've been taking a lot of L's to my theories. Now, if you guys remember my theory video about the Demon King's fate, my first thing was that he was destroyed. He's done, he's gone, he's not coming back. My second theory was, which is not the one I, it was not on top, so I'm still taking the L, but my second theory, if you go check that video out, was that he was pushed back, he was pushed out of Meliodas' body, back to his old decrepit, with one arm cut off, body in purgatory. And now that he's found a new vessel, he's swapped again. Not a trope I like in Shonen Villains doing the whole body host and swapping and stuff for power, but it is what it is. Um, this implies to me is the fact that what they meant to say was because he found a new vessel and now he's physically back here again, he can bring the curse back. That if, for example, if the Ten Commandments had remained 
um, destroyed, or if they had remained, if, if Zeldris had not become the Demon King, the curse would still be broken. The Demon King has no sway over the curse while in purgatory, though still alive. I don't think they meant to imply that it's tied to the life of the Demon King, more so that uh, his physical presence to be able to invoke power, which is also brought up in uh, future dialogue here in the chapter, that he's able to invoke his abilities, his power, his presence in the physical world. Once he's able to do that, Meliodas can't destroy the curse any longer. Because that seems to be a better... You, you would think if the Supreme Deity was dead, it would not have been just ble you know shrugged off with this one bit of dialogue and we would have known this uh, many, many chapters ago. So I'm going to hold out that that is the case, that because Zell just took in the Ten Commandments and he has a physical presence back in the physical world outside of purgatory, he is able to reinvoke the curse on Elizabeth. That's the way I'm taking it. Um, once again, I still do have the issue with um, them giving this detail when it became plot relevant and not before, but that's just a little nitpick. Now, the rest of the chapter moves on to say about uh, Chandler and Cusack. And here's where we get another little issue for me is the fact that not only did you bring these characters back, just to basically both get slaughtered. He brought them back for half a chapter uh, to get slaughtered. Ah, that very, very heavy character used as a plot device just to move the plot along here. Um, and then thrown away because they, they've already had their battle, they've already done their story, there's no other, they did the original demon, they did their fusion, they're done. I mean, once again, I don't like the treatment of that. I, I, I'm seeing a lot of plot... Heavy plot device usage here, and I'm, I'm just, I'm nitpicking here, guys. The chapter was still fine. The chapter was still pretty good. I'd still give it a, a solid 8 or 8.5. Maybe with that reveal at the end, I mean, it, it's always going to be high ranked, but, uh, and I'm okay with where the story is going. Zelda says the Demon King, that's fine, but the way we got here still has issues to me. Um, throwing those characters away, uh, feels a little, uh, dis like, I'm disheartened by that a bit, just to, to bring them back for that sole reason, because it was left ambiguous. Are they destroyed? Are they not? And I have some issues with the fact that nobody noticed the presence of the demon, the Ten Commandments. Nobody know like, Meliodas clearly, like, I believe that the Ten Commandments were inside Meliodas' body. Clearly, he knew better, and the rest of the fandom did. So, nobody thought to go check. Merlin... Fairy King, Harley Quinn, uh, Elizabeth, Meliodas himself, nobody thought, okay, Zelda's disappeared. Ten Commandments disappeared. Mmm, addition, anybody. One plus one equals two a little bit here. Nobody thought to check on where to try to find Zelda's by the sounds of this. Nobody could sense Cusack. Nobody could, nobody witnessed, and apparently from the look of this panel where they jump right through the fog, he was standing feet distance, not miles, feet, yards worth of distance outside of all the sins with all their power. Yes, they're tired, but you're telling me with all their sensory abilities and all their magic and all their strength and all their power that they could not have sent Cusack destroying Chandler, that they could not uh, see that he grabbed, he clearly Cusack used darkness, had enough strength to use darkness to grab the Ten Commandments and bolt. And nobody sensed him using the darkness. Nobody sensed him doing this. Um, and nobody, once again, since for these last three days or however long it's been, nobody has sensed um, him basically becoming the Demon King. I, I mean, they're, they're talking about the world being destroyed, like, like miles and countries away. And they know that's happening, but they don't know that a literal god is creating a new vessel however many miles away from them. I, I'm, I'm not buying that. I, I find I'm finding some flaws here. Also, the fact that for some reason the punishment thing. See, once again, all this plot convenience for me. It feels like so Chandler and Cusack were punished. They fused back together and accepted their fate that they're going to die. They became the original demon once again. Um, and their ability crisis. It was basically going to eat away at their life. They were able to fuse, and that was the punishment. It's like, oh, we could fuse back whenever we wanted to, and our punishment was to take care of the kids. But once we fuse back together, that's it. We're done. You know, that's our, we're going to have like one last ride, like the Ghost Rider movie sort of idea. Same idea. And uh, that kind of mentality. 
this attack from male for some reason, I mean, it, it just feels kind of weak sauce to me, guys. I'm a little salty about this. It feels weak sauce, to use a dead meme. Um, in the simple fact that they just so happened to make this in time that no, that didn't happen, and you don't stay in your original body, you won't be destroyed, uh, you'll split back into two, and Crisis ain't going to affect you anymore. All from males attack by what's implied? I, the, the plot convenience of what's going on is heavy, leading us up to this moment. I feel like this could have been handled far better. That's all I think. Once again, I've only been doing nitpicking in this chapter review, and I'm sorry to say that, guys. I'm being more critical. Um, I, I'm, I'm not feeling very salty about the, the L's I took. The Demon King wasn't dead. Fine. Uh, the Ten Commandments were around. They were disappearing. That is something. But I took an L for that. Fine. Um, but I don't think that takes away from the fact that I, I don't like the plot convenience points that I've made. Now, as far as the rest of the chapter goes, like, in between all these issues, I, li I like this. I like the fact that, okay, uh, even though it was a bad reason, I don't have a problem with Elizabeth's curse still being a thing. They're still timed, right? Um, this is going to be an excuse for them to have another major battle. The Demon King is still alive. Cusack and Chandler coming back for, to, to basically take the win away. Um, and the whole concept of the fact that Cusack thought he was doing this all for Zeldris, but really he was doing it for the Demon King. Zeldris wakes up in time to basically go, no, no, stop, stop. And because Zeldris knows exactly what this is going to do. And Cusack doesn't know it. He wasn't there. And I won't even say that wasn't plot convenience. That was the way the story went. And this could have went. So that's, I'm totally fine with. That was cool. Him cutting down Chandler because he found the opportunity. Like, once again, I wish Cusack had stayed alive. Him cutting down Chandler made total sense for the character in the story. Them coming back to life is a little iffy, but the fact that he cut him down, I'm totally okay with. Cusack then biting the dust, you know, four pages later. Damn. But nonetheless, really, really cool the build up to that. Having Chandler and Cusack back for even that little bit was really awesome. And seeing Zeldris, the Prince of Darkness, the GOAT, back in full form has been like, I'm so hyped for 312. This was a hype-building chapter, though, once again, I found some plot uh, convenience problems, uh, plot device convenience, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I found some issues. The pacing seems to be like we were wrapping up the end of the series, and at the very least, we were wrapping up this arc, and now we're, boom, we're jumping right into a middle. There's no wait time. we got to jump to the next portion. Almost like this was like a filler, like that epilogue thing was almost like that filler break. You guys remember when Netflix came out with the supposed season two of uh, Taizai, but it wasn't season two. It was not Revival of the Commandments. It was just four episodes of filler in between season one and the start of season two. Do you guys remember that? That's what that epilogue now feels like. It doesn't feel like we've started the next stage, a new arc. And it doesn't feel like the series is over anymore. It feels like we're going to continue for well beyond the uh, 40 volumes that Nakaba originally claimed, or this is going to go beyond August. However, that's the way it feels now, and I'm okay with that. However, this something just feels a little off with these last couple chapters to me. That might just be my own personal feelings. What do you guys think down in the comment section down below? Are you guys hyped for chapter 312? Because I certainly am, as you guys can tell, even though I nitpicked a lot. As I said, there were so many positives that came out of this chapter. Um, even with my little bit of nitpicking and griping about uh, the plot convenience. So, to stop harping on that, uh, let's just take away the good, the last panel of Zeldris in full Demon King form. I'm alive, Meliodas. Now, now we're gonna get, now we're gonna get the battle we deserve because a lot of people, myself included, believe that that battle was rushed and wasn't, even though it was drawn beautifully and there were some cool moments in the Demon King fight, it was too short, not enough action, not enough combined attacks, not enough uh, epic, all enthralling sort of idea. Now we have the potential. Now we have the potential for hype. It's going to be Prince of Darkness, King of the Demons, Zeldris against Demon King Zeldris against everybody. And where's Mael? Mael going to come back? Eskinor going to get his grace back? Remember, it was only borrowed. The potential. The potential is here for some epic, epic showdown. And I'm, I'm feeling the hype, and I'm worried about Gelda. Are you guys worried about Gelda? One of the best girls in Taizai. I'm worried about her. So, that being said, guys, 
hope you look forward to 312, same as I am. This review has gone on long enough, one of my longest reviews. Uh, like, comment, and subscribe. As always, it's always very much appreciated. This has been Griever with your Behind the Bar Reviews for Chapter 311 of Seven Deadly Sins, also known as Nanatsu no Taizai. Drink responsibly as always, guys, and we'll see you later.